We are, we're doing our series right now, The Christian Way, Ethics Rooted in Truth. And this is an important sermon series, I feel like, for us as we talk about things that are happening every day in our culture. Every time you turn on the news, every time you scroll through your Facebook feed, we are just being bombarded constantly with what this culture is bringing at us. And so that's why this sermon series hit my heart of, of things that we're needing to talk about. It's not a normal series for this. We are going to have to do a lot of um, extra biblical work, if I can say that. We have to understand how we got to where we are. So this, just hang with me these four weeks. If this is dense and, and a little bumpy for you, um, I think it's critical, especially as I look at the younger generation, that they understand why they think the way they think. For you to understand why this generation thinks like they do, if it seems like a foreign language to you. And in that vein, I want to recommend some resources to you. I had a lot of people re reach out last week and ask me about some things. This is probably one of the most important books written in the last 30 years, at least, in evangelicalism. It's called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. He basically outlines everything I'm talking about. He goes into much greater depth. Uh, there's a smaller version of this as well that's somewhere buried in my stacks of books called Strange New World. So this one is pretty intimidating. It's long. It's a lot more intense. But his book, Strange New World, a lot more accessible, Carl Truman from Crossway. If you are the philosophically minded person, uh, last week I mentioned Charles Taylor. I'll talk about him again today. He is the philosopher of the secular world in terms of identifying it, defining it, helping us understand it. His big tome called A Secular Age is very difficult. Uh, this book, The Ethics of Authenticity, get at a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today as well. It is philosophical, but it is accessible too, I think. So if you're somebody who wants to dive a little bit deeper, even from a non-evangelical source, this would be a good one. Finally, a book that I've asked Noah to make sure that we give to every graduating senior this year, Do Not Be True to Yourself by Kevin DeYoung. Uh, Kevin DeYoung is an extremely gifted communicator and author who really grabs the zeitgeist of this age and tells us to deny it, right? To not be true to yourself in an age that says be true to yourself. So those are some resources that you might find helpful. What a great youth pastor catching books and everything. <laughs> Wonderful. That was the final test. All right, well, let me pray and we'll jump in. Father, who are we? gathered in this church today, except those who cry out from the heart, Lord, I need you. Every hour, I need you. Uh, those who recognize we need you for salvation and we need you to sustain us in this life. Uh, we need you to help us persevere as we think about all these challenges in culture today and the ways that we're being tossed about by the waves. We need that sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, the Lord Jesus Christ. The anchor that holds behind the veil. Uh, the anchor that assures us that sins have been atoned. That resurrection is possible. And that one day we'll be with you forever. So give us the strength and the boldness to endure these days. And God, I do pray for those who uh, are lost. They don't know Christ. They have fully taken in what this culture has had to say. That they will hear these things today. That they will be awakened to new life and lord those who are just struggling in their mind pulled in every direction that they would see the wisdom of your word and plant their flag there praise in the powerful name of jesus christ our lord amen well growing up there was an expression that i heard a lot and i mean i heard it a bunch of times anytime my parents said something that puzzled me i heard it every time that i kind of pushed back against what my parents were telling me I heard it. I heard this phrase so many times growing up that if I had a dollar for every time I heard it, I would not be your pastor. I'd be a billionaire on the beach somewhere enjoying the sandy life. And here's the phrase, because I said so. I heard it all the time growing up. Anybody have parents who said, because I said so? Now, now who's got the courage to say, I am a because I told you so parent, because I said so? Yeah. Absolutely, because I said so. Uh, don't go to that place. Why? Because I said so. Don't do that thing. Why? Because I said so. Don't have that friend. Why? Because I said so. Over and over and over again, I would hear these things. And to be fair, I was that kid just like every other kid who asked a bazillion times in my life, why? 
And my parents got fatigued of answering the question. So it would just be because I said so. Because I'm telling you this, and I'm your parent, and what I say goes in this house. And there's a thing about maturity level. There's times when we say things to our kids that we know they're not going to fully understand yet, but we say it to them, and they want to push back, and we say, just trust us, because I said so. Now that I'm a parent, I really get it, especially as the kids are younger. Something just sparks in you to let that fly when the kids answer back. Yes, I had already written this part of my sermon. And I heard one of my kids from across the house, Dad, can I, and fill in the blank with whatever ridiculous thing they wanted to do. And I was like, no, you can't do that. Why? Because I said so. I was like, oh man, you are the man. (laughs) Saying the very thing that I thought I wouldn't say. And I've even said things like, because I said so and I'm a lot smarter than you. So, I mean, I'm just like confessing parental challenges to you right now. But this is the age we live in. Because I said so, because I told you so. Now listen, when that transfers over into our view of God, things get really askew. A lot of people imagine that with what the Bible commands or prohibits is basically God just saying to us, because I said so, just do it. I told you to do those things, why? Just do it. I told you not to do those things, why? Because I said so. And that's not how God portrays himself in Scripture. The place this is pressing in most for us these days is the area of human sexuality. We've got a culture asking constantly why. They say, well, I I, I hear what seems to me like either puritanical or Victorian age sexual ethics, and those seem to be something of yesteryear, and I'm just asking why. And there seems like there's no good answers for this from Christians. And so apparently the Bible probably doesn't have a good answer for this. So why are we holding on to that morality at all anymore? Here's what it sounds like, and it sounds good to the ear of so many people. Why do Christians care about sex so much? Why does it matter to you what other people are doing? Why can't people be free to love whomever they want? And then when God comes into the equation, it sounds like this. Why would God make people gay if it was wrong? Or Why don't Christians support monogamous gay marriage? God loves love, and we should love love too. These are the questions that are just constantly coming at us. It's the why of things, and so many Christians just say, because that's what God said. Because that's just it. And their their questions begin to chip away at their own faith until eventually they say, you know what, that doesn't have any answers for me. I'm going to go into the culture and into the world that seems to be able to answer these. I, I remember growing up and seeing bumper stickers on cars that said, the Bible says it. I believe it, that settles it. That dog ain't going to hunt in this age for people. They're asking why, and the good thing is that the Bible actually tells us why. So I'm going to be asking a big question for us today, and that is this. Why does sex belong in monogamous heterosexual marriage? And the big idea is this. Sex and marriage reflect God's relationship with his church. Or we're going to see that that's the why behind so many questions that we get in regards to marriage and human sexuality today. Last week we did a bit of a crash course in the erosion of Western society. I gave what I would consider a 50,000 foot overview, tracing about 400 years of what's happened in the Enlightenment and Darwinian evolution and postmodernism to get us to this place today where truth is no longer absolute it's more localized for a lot of people. Now today what I want to do is kind of narrow in and say, if this is true of culture writ large, how do we take one specific area and and see it unfold, the thoughts that people have in Scripture's response to it? And that one particular area is, is human sexuality. So last week we said that there's a shift that has occurred. We said it's now the secular age in which we live. And we could define that so basically as it's easier now in our day and age for kids growing up to believe that there's not a God than to believe that there is a God. And so the sacred and the secular are being divided and more and more people are going into that place of just saying, I simply do not believe that there is a God anymore. Along with that, we we said that one of the chief virtues of today is authenticity. Charles Taylor outlines this in his book, Secular Age, and then in the uh, Ethics of Authenticity. But at rock bottom of these discussions are questions that are gnawing at the soul of this generation. And it sounds like this. 
how do I know who I am? What do I mean when I talk about the self? At what point does my sense of self and my purpose in life and my aim at happiness intersect? It's questions of identity and questions of happiness. And so identity along with happiness becomes the magnetic north that our moral compass points to. So I got to know who I am and I, I, I want to be happy and culture tells me it's this way. So if I identify myself or want to live my true authentic life, whatever that means, I'm going to go that way. Well, that's now pointing north in my moral compass and that's the direction that I'm going to go. How did we get this mindset? First, I want to just tell you it's not novel. It's amazing to me how often I hear this in our world today. And, and when I talk to a 30-year-old or a 20-year-old or a 15-year-old, they say it as though they're creating something so profound and unique. I just got to be who I am. I just got to be true to myself. I just got to live out who I know I really am on the inside. If you knew who I really, really was, and I've got to live that out through my life. It's not actually profound. It's something that's been handed down to us. The two greatest thinkers in the last several centuries who've brought us to this point today, the first one is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And it was Rousseau who shifted man away from society and a greater community to the inward self. So society was the repressive agent or has become to be the oppressor of this age. And you've got to break free from that. You shouldn't belong to that. If you can fit into a mold or an ilk, something's wrong with you. Every individual has to live the totally free, individualized life, hampered by nothing, concerns for nothing. So the goal was to break out of societal norms and live your authentic self. And even though most people would not style themselves as Freudian, Sigmund Freud is the next big thinker because Sigmund Freud made everything about sex. For Freud, it was the pleasure principle. Sex equals happiness. Happiness equals the good life. So if Rousseau turned everything onto the inside and I've got to be authentic and I've got to be the real me, the true me, and Freud said the real true you at base is sexual, well then everything becomes about the sexual identity. And we identify ourselves this way. That is the most common way people want to identify themselves. If you say, who are you? They're going to get pretty quickly to, how, what are my pronouns? How do I identify myself? What gender am I? Who do I attract to sexually? Becomes the fundamental identity marker in this age. It's the greatest irony of our day. The greatest irony is that sex can be everything so that we identify ourselves completely according to it. And sex can mean nothing. So why can't people just sleep around? Why, why are we even introducing words like body count into our vocabulary? How many people have you slept with? And it really doesn't matter. It's the swapping of biological material. It's nothing more than that. So it's not really a big deal. But it's not really a big deal, but it's everything. It's everything to this world today. And now we are governed by our desires. If it feels good, do it. If you have an inner impulse, gratify it. The worst possible thing you can do is suppress it. So do you have homosexual desires? Lean in. Do you feel like a woman in a man's body? Live that out through surgery and pharmaceuticals. Does your appetite desire more than one sexual partner? Fulfill that urge. Uh, that's what we're told today. I'm helped by Tim Keller on a lot of things. One of them in particular is a story that he's told in recent years. Uh, he, he actually just recently passed away. But he said, I want you to imagine a Viking in the year 900. And this Viking is talking to some of other his Viking friends. and They're all a bunch of teenagers together. And he says, I've got two desires in my heart right now. I've got a desire to kill people. And I've got a desire for homosexuality. The advice that he would get is, man, you really need to suppress that homosexual piece. But lean into the violence. We kill people. That's what we do. That's the Viking identity. Be that. Don't be this. And he says, now imagine a man living in Manhattan today. And he tells his friends, he says, I've got two desires in my heart. One is to kill people. And two is homosexuality. What would the advice be today? Oh, man, you've got to really suppress that desire to harm people. And you've got to really lean in to the desire for homosexuality. That's who you are. You see, desires have shifted over the ages, and the reality is both those desires would need to be suppressed. But we live in an age where desire reigns supreme. I wonder in this area what 
has gripped your heart. Uh, one of the things we, we're going to say today is every person in here is a sexual sinner. How does that desire enter into your heart? But before we leave this, as we're setting the stage, I do want to talk about how technology has aided us. Carl Truman said this, and I think he's dead on. Uh, the way that this, all this uh, sexual revolution occurred is fairly simple to discern. First, there was promiscuous behavior. Then there was the technology to facilitate it in the form of contraception and antibiotics. And as technology enabled the sexual promiscuous to avoid the natural consequences of their actions, that is, unwanted pregnancies or disease, so those rationale, rationales that justified the behavior became more plausible and arguments against it became less so. And therefore, the behavior itself became more acceptable. That's the age in which we lived in. All these things, all these ideas happening, technology comes in, and all of a sudden you get to the full frontal sexual revolution that we see today, where sex is untethered from everything. All right, that's a lot. That's a lot of terrain moving very fast. I want to kind of give a succinct summary of, of what I'm saying before we enter into what Scripture would say about this. The first shift is to the secular. So it's no longer sacred. We're not tied to that anymore. So we're free in, in the modern conception not to have God who's saying, this is how you have to order your life. Now it's up to every individual, how am I going to order my life? And because the individual is the final authority, no one can say to them, hey, that's not the right way. The second thing is the shift to the inner man through Jean-Jacques Rousseau that I have some inner man inside of me that's being repressed, that yearns to be out. Freud told us that person is ultimately sexual and then technology exacerbated everything and gave it the runway for it to take off in the way that it has. So that's where we're at. So, so what, do we, what do we do with this? Uh, you no doubt have scratched your head and thought about this and been in conversations with people and you just think, I don't even know how to respond to that. It's so pervasive today. And we enter in Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 because scripture has a lot to say about marriage and sex. And I'm going to focus on the why of marriage, but I want to show you the why of sex as well and how these are tied together. Because before we go into the idea of marriage, let me just say that over and over and over again, Scripture assumes sex to be within the confines of monogamous heterosexual marriage. Uh, listen to Hebrews 13, 4, where it's explicit. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. There's something sacred about the marriage bed, and God has told us to preserve that. Well, what is that? The biblical sexual ethic is that sex can only glorify God in marriage, and marriage consistently, in fact, exclusively, is defined as between a man and a woman. So if you've got your text, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, down through the end of the chapter, we read this. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself, gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However... Let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This passage teaches us tons. We could spend a month in just this passage, and we're going to gloss over a lot of the things in this, because I really want to focus on Paul's point in verse 32. This is a profound mystery, and I'm telling you, it refers to Christ and the church. Here it is. If you've been zoned out, you're not really paying attention, come back with me for a second. Because this is where the rubber hits the road. Why is sex meant for marriage 
And what is marriage even all about anyway? It is the picture of Christ in the church. That's the why. Because when God was designing marriage, it wasn't Paul sitting there thinking, I wonder if today I can think of a good illustration as I'm writing to the Ephesians. What is Christ in the church like? Huh, not like parents and children, maybe a husband and a wife. That's not it. Paul's argument is God described, defined, thought of in his mind the relationship between Christ and the church first. That is the prior relationship. And then God created marriage so that we would reflect in our marriages what Christ and the church is like. That is so key to understanding the entire sexual revolution from a Christian worldview. It's all about Christ and the church. Sexuality and marriage. So as we look at this text, I, I, you want to talk about whole truckloads of unpopular things today. Even beginning with wives submit to your husband. That's not popular today. But, but I, I don't remember the last time God was in a popularity contest. I don't remember God's word ever being aligned with where the world was at. Look, the world's going to swerve in and out every possible way. And God's word stands. And if he's defined what these things are and told us why he's defining the things the way that he's defining them, and he wants our best, then these are good things for us. We don't have time to go into all this, but the only thing told to women in this passage is submit to your husbands. The whole rest of it's the burden of the husband. And yet we see so many women read that today and they just shut down. But it's for their good, and it's for the good of families, and it's for the good of the churches, and it's for the good of the gospel. As the gospel goes out and people see the Christian community lives different than the world, oh my goodness, it works. What, what do they have that I don't have? But if we're going to live like the world, we shouldn't expect to see our lives that differently than the world does. No, Christ in this situation is the husband. Uh, the wives are representative of the church and husbands, you are told the harder part. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave himself up for her. He died for her. He came into this world to get a hold of his church and to go after them and to redeem them and to forgive them of their sins and to cover them. Husbands, that's your responsibility. Look, I think every husband in this room, I hope, if it came down to it today to die for your wife, she was about to get hit by a car. You had the split-second decision to throw yourself in between her and the car. I think you would say yes. But how are you doing in dying daily to yourself for your wife? That's the harder piece, I think, than a one-time giving up your life for her. How are we doing at that? Christ gave all of himself to us. He's presenting the church uh, the bride, spotless, laying down his life. Satan constantly attacks the family. Think, think at the very beginning. The very beginning of the story. Adam is given the command not to eat. Who does Satan go to? Eve. Already he's trying to split the family. Our, our kids are little Satans sometimes, aren't they? Mom, can I do this? No. Dad, can I do this? Yeah, I don't see why not. The serpent has slithered into the home. <laughs> it's a very cute serpent. But what happens? We say all the time, wait, 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 wait. What did your mother say? She said no? Then no. I, I told one of my kids yesterday, I said, it's, it's like mom and dad versus you guys. <laughs> like we are an unbreakable force. But Satan wants to break that unbreakable force all the time at every turn. If he can destroy the family, so he slithers in and separates Adam and Eve on that question. Next chapter in your Bible, Cain is killing Abel. The family is constantly under attack. We shouldn't be surprised that it's happening in this day. And Christ sets forward a better ideal for what this is going to look like for us. And for those who might be tempted, as I hear oftentimes in culture today... That's what Paul says, but Jesus never said that. Two problems. One, 
You can't pit Jesus against Paul. All this from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is the inspired word of God, spoken through the Holy Spirit, through his messengers. Every word in your Bible is a red letter word. Christ says it all because the same spirit that animated him animated the writers who wrote this. So what Paul says is what Jesus says. So first, it's the doctrine of scripture problem. But second, in Matthew 19, Jesus quotes the same scripture that Paul quotes here from Genesis. Jesus said, he answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. The only way to have a one flesh union is between a man and a woman. So they are no longer two but one flesh, but God is therefore joined together. Let no man separate. This picture is supposed to be so beautiful. This picture is supposed to be pointing beyond our marriages to something so glorious about God and who God is. And that's why every aberrant sexual ideology and practice today deviates from this picture of Christ in the church. Think about pornography. Pornography promises intimacy without the hassle of another person. It's the benefit without the sacrifice. Premarital sex, non-committal. Again, you want the benefit of marriage without the covenant of marriage. That's not how God treated his bride. That's not how Christ treated his bride. I'm going to put you in a relationship with me, and it's going to be a covenantal relationship, and my promises are going to be spoken over you, and they're going to become true. Not, I'm going to date the church for a little while, and I'm going to take advantage of, of that relationship, and then I'm going to disregard it. Homosexuality says there's two Christs, or two brides. It misses the complementarity that God meant in forming human marriage. That's why homosexuality is wrong. It distorts the picture that God has given us of Christ in the church. Polyamory, becoming a lot more popular. It's dissatisfaction with the one you have. You need more to feel fulfilled. Think about what this would be like in this illustration of Christ in the church. Christ, yeah, I've got my bride not fulfilled. Who else can I go and seek more fulfillment from? Can you imagine Christ saying that? That's what we're saying in polyamorous kind of relationships. But what about divorce? Divorce displays the unthinkable, that Jesus at some time would abandon his bride, or that his bride would abandon him. Do you see the beautiful picture put before us in Ephesians 5 of what this ideal is held up to be and it's glorious, and it's brilliant, and it's purposeful, and it answers the deepest questions of our heart. It answers the longings of our souls. It, it quenches that desire because the God set it up this way. Now, here's who's in this room, the sexually broken, the people who hear this and they think, I've got a pornography addiction. I've, I've been divorced. I'm having an affair right now. What does the word say? What is Jesus' point in coming? Verse 26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The whole idea behind that is she was wrinkled, and she did have spots, and there were stains all over because of the sin that we experience as the bride of Christ. And Jesus says, I came to wash it clean in the blood of the Lamb. Like, that's what Calvary is for, is sexual sinners. Those who say, I can't believe I've messed up, the cross is for you. That's the hope that we have here. It's not that we were perfect and God then loved us. It's that God took the broken and made it whole. God took the lost and made it found. Uh, to those who have a pornography addiction, there's hope. And for those of you who struggle with same-sex attraction, that may be a lifelong struggle, but there's hope in the gospel. For those who are having sex before marriage, man, God can restore and reconcile. Uh, those who are in the midst of adultery right now, God can restore and reconcile. You haven't gone too far. None of you have committed an unpardonable sin. What is it going to take? Repentance. The recognition, God, I, these weren't just sins because I didn't do what you said. These were sins that fundamentally lied about who you are because it doesn't put forward the beautiful expression 
of Christ in the church. One of the most beautiful things is this is going somewhere. It's not just this cute illustration that we see in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, but in the book of Revelation in chapter 19, verses 6 through 9, we get to see where this thing is heading to. It's culminating. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of many peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. There's a marriage supper of the Lamb coming. This is what history is going to be culminating to. If you're in Christ and you're part of the Big C Church Universal, one day you're going to be there. And the groom is making himself ready. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's purifying and sanctifying his church even now as he's gathering the people together and one day that's going to issue into a marriage supper of the lamb can you imagine what that day is going to be like and now we have the picture in front of us of christ in the church faithfulness in this age will we be those who represent what the church is supposed to look like i'm going to give you two points of application as we wind down. What what do we do with this? First, as he says here, we're washed with the water of the word. We are washed with the word. Listen, the biggest temptation I hear from people today who are drifting on this issue, it always begins like this. I have a friend who's homosexual. I've got a family member who told me they're gay. I've got grandkids that I love. They're living together. Maybe it's not that big of a deal. I've got a friend who just struggles with pornography. It just is. And, and we take those and we place them above the word as more authoritative, more significant, truer than what the word of God has said. And I'm going to beg you not to do that. We start with the word of God. We start with what God has said. And it's not a because I told you so, God. It is a here's why kind of God. He's told us washing of the water with the word. This should be the soil that we're planted in. Last week we talked about how we combat erosion is by planting good things. You've got to plant good things in your heart. Scripture is the soil from which life can come. These are God's words, all of them, and they're true, and they're holy, and they're good, and they're pure, and they're for your best. The biggest lie of the devil is to say God's keeping something from you. Going back to Adam and Eve, doesn't that fruit look good? If God really loved you, he wouldn't keep that from you. And God is saying, I would keep you from the things that will destroy your life. That's what he says in his word. I think an illustration we could use is if I had some beakers up here and we, we had a pure water beaker, but the thoughts and ideas of the culture and the world just begin to drip in like red food coloring and the water begins to get red over time. What we need to do is take the pure water of the word and begin to dump it into that. And over time, it's going to let all those other pieces spill out of it so that only truth remains. But you've got to be in the word. You've got to know what God says. A lot of Christians have ideas about what God says, but they don't know what God says. And they can't answer the why of why God has said the things that he has said. It matters. You've got to know those things for your own heart and for the people we're called to disciple in this generation. Second, meaningful marriages. We need Christian marriages that reflect this ideal. We've got to hold this out as God's beautiful plan and idea that it's a good thing we got to be done with disdainful ways that marriage is talked about oh the old ball and chain at least i used to have sex before i got married then i got married ugly and derogatory things like don't buy the cow unless you've had some of the milk what are we talking about 
Do you talk well of your spouse? Guys, when you're at work and the topic of marriage comes up, how are you talking about your wife? Or what are you saying that if she were around would deeply disgrace her? Ladies, when you get together with the girlfriends, are you talking well of marriage? Well, or is it complain session time? Everybody start piling on the husbands. Look how dumb my husband is. Well, guess what? Guess what dumb thing my husband did? Because that's really popular in culture today. Or are you speaking well of your husband? Are you speaking well of your spouses? Listen, uh, what, would, what would marriage look like that looked like this? Tertullian was an early third century church father. So we're going way back in the vault. Listen to what he said about marriage. How beautiful then the marriage of two Christians, two who are one in hope, one in desire, one in the way of life they follow, one in religion they practice. They are both servants of the same master. Nothing divides them, either in flesh or in spirit. They are in very truth two in one flesh, and when there is one And and when there is but one flesh, there is also but one spirit. They pray together. They worship together. They fast together, instructing one another, encouraging one another, strengthening one another. What if our marriages look like that? Then I think the world would say, man, there is something vastly different about the way that First Baptist people have their marriages. Man, I've got to know, how do you love one another so much? How are your families intact and united? What what is that love that just spills over between you two and you say, I've got a Christian marriage and it's pointing to something far greater? Can I tell you about Jesus? Because all I want to do in my marriage is make much of Christ by showing the world what Christ in the church is supposed to look like. Does your marriage reflect that? Does your home reflect this? Well, at the beginning I said, we, we got to start with why. People are going to be asking why. We don't want to say just because I said so. Simon Sinek wrote the book, Start With Why, and he says this. There are only two ways to influence human behavior. You can manipulate it or you can inspire it. I think we run a, a risk today as believers in this culture of trying to manipulate it. And just trying to make our way or something the way. And what I'm saying is there is a Christian way, and it's the beautiful way, and it's the good way, and it's the way that will lead others to Christ. It will be the way that leads others to salvation if we will display the glory of Christ and his church in our marriages. That's the why. Let's pray. Father, I do pray for those in particular who are struggling with sexual sin. Even as I'm talking today, they feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their hearts, calling them to a better way. Lord, would you give them boldness and courage even now? And Lord, for all of us, let us not be angry, shout down, culture warriors. That's not what you've called us to. You've called us to just point out the better way, to show it, to live it, to demonstrate it, to let Christ rule in our lives and in our homes. God, let that be true of us. And when we fail, pick us back up and get us going again, that we might show the world your greatness. Praise in Christ's name. Amen.